I saved a lot of money in therapy. Uh, when, I was a, when I was a kid in junior high school, I, my, my gym teacher, I forgot my shorts one day, and he said, why are you going to go outside and run? And I thought, ooh, I hate this guy. I hate this guy. Why is he? Why is he? What if I fall? You know, my, my jersey, my top was down to my knees because you buy them big when you're in middle school. But I thought, if I fall, I got nothing there but a jock strap. And I got back to the locker room, and I imagined, because when I was a kid, I still saw a lot of black and white movies, and I imagined what they call a Saturday Night Special. I imagined a gun in my locker. I was going to shoot that dead. <laughs> uh, but I didn't do it, you know? Nowadays, Maybe kids, they see movies and they say, well, that's, that gives me a license to kill. You don't, you don't kill, you imagine killing. And it, what was great about that role is that I could imagine doing anything to anyone. <laughs> and anything, and get away with it. So, like I said, it just, you, using your imagination, it was great. As all the roles that I play, as any actor plays, you just let yourself be free. And it was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hello, Robert. Uh, welcome in our country. Uh, I saw the Prison Break series five months ago for the first time. Shame on me for watching too late. And uh, after I saw all your acting through the four seasons, I only I could only think of, for one character for yourself who fits yourself, uh, the Joker. In Ber in Ber in Ber in Ber I heard this before. <laughs> I know. Uh, do it's cast, somebody's playing it. <laughs> uh, do you receive any offers for playing Joker? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have to wait another 20 years. Uh, I wish him the best. You know, I think it's a, it's a great role. Uh, but no, not yet. We'll see. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hello, Teodoro. Um, Hello. <laughs> um, when you play T-Bag, did you see something special, something useful in the fact that he always uh, got by, he always, uh, you know, had a plan, a backup plan, always had, some, had something in his mind, uh, played others as well, uh, and basically just conquered the world in his small universe? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think when I started that job, I thought of two things. One is, I want, I want T-Bag to stay alive for as long as possible. And uh, why ever, however it happened, he, he lived and lives the whole time of the season, uh, the whole four seasons. Uh, and I also I just wanted a job for as long as I could have it. Um, I should tell you now there's a very, very strong rumor that Prison Break will be back. Um, put it out there that you like that idea? <laughs> that would be a problem. I don't think that would be a problem. Uh, that, there's nothing definite yet, but I, I, I have, a, I have I've heard some good rumblings that it's going to happen, and let them know if you want me to be a part of it. If you yeah. think Can you have the it. producer at us? It's a tricky thing because you know, everywhere I go in the world, people know me. Hey, T-Bag, T-Bag, T-Bag. I like hearing Robert, Robert, Robert. Um, <laughs> before T-Bag, 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 I was, uh, aren't you an actor? Uh, tell me the five things you've done. And I was an actor for about 20 years before uh, T-Bag. And I gotta tell you, I like, I like people calling me by my name. I, I do like that. Playing T-Bag again would help people know my name again instead of uh, tea bag, tea bag, tea bag. So it's 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 goods and, and minuses to to reboot it and not to reboot it, but to continue on the story. So we'll see, we'll see. Thank you. But if it went back on air, um, do you think that for once tea bag should really try to fool everybody that he he is the good guy? He tries to get his life back on track. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, there, there was a show on Fox, I can't remember his name right now, John, somebody, it was called uh, America's Most Wanted. Yeah. Right? And it's this guy, 
that lost his son or his daughter in real life to crime, to a criminal, so he devoted his life to getting the bad guy. I can't remember his name right now. He, uh, he cornered me one night. There's these things called the upfronts in New York, where all the advertisers from around the country get together. And he said, this was after the second season, and he said, you, you, I'd love you on that show. I'd love Prison Break. He said, I want you to, I want you to do me a favor. He said, remember something. He said, you're the guy. You're the guy that I'm always going after, that I'm always trying to get, and I can never get him. He's very slippery. He's very smart. And he said, I hope you tell the writers that no matter how much T-Bag wants to believe that he's going to be good, that he's going to turn the corner, that he's going to be all right, he is and he always will be a, criminal. a predator. Yeah. And there's nothing he can do to stop that. And that's the sad horrible thing about those kind of people. I mean, the fact that we even cared about that character, going from, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, to, I still hate you, but I don't want you dead. <laughs> it, it, the psychosis of that character, the sociopathic behavior of that man that you watched, like a train wreck that was about to happen, and you watched it with, <laughs> you know, one eye, because it was fascinating to watch the machinations of this guy, of what he was thinking. Uh, it, it, it's, it's really unbelievable how the writers, and I have to say the writers, not me, but the writers captured that in that character. That, those are some sick puppies, let me tell you. They, they know how to write, for all of us, but they know how to write sociopaths. It was my job just to be able to look at that page and go, oh my god, no, oh my god, oh my god, I can't believe I would do that. But I would do it, because that's my job as an actor. Yeah, I guess we all like to indulge in a bit of anarchy and madness every now and then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you very much for You're so You're welcome. amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello. 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 Uh, first, I want to say I'm really happy I got to meet you in reality. I saw you in prison break and called and narrow and flash. Um, and um, Am I want... scary as a t bag to you? No. <laughs> no, Actually, that was what my question was about. Uh, if um, T-Bag is kind of creepy, and I want to, <laughs> to ask you if you identify in any way with T-Bag. You know, I was always taught to use my imagination. Uh, I, I think the one thing that I would say is Similar to him is I never give up. <laughs> but the other parts, no. No, I'm not a killer. I imagine <laughs> killing that coach. <laughs> it sounded great, but I didn't really do it. Thank you. I like it. same question that's already been answered with the veterinarian thingy. Yeah. Now that that's been set out, okay, it's fine. So I'm going with my second best question. Uh, so if you could pick any two characters in the world, a good one and a bad one to play, which ones would they be? I'm so busy trying to find my next job, I don't think too far ahead. Uh, by the way, I'll, I'll tell you that some of the things that are coming up that I'm doing that are, are really great, fun roles. Um, I'm kind of itching to get back on the stage. I started in the theater years ago when I was a little kid. I, I, I did little school plays and like everybody else, and I did a little summer theater in my, uh, my little community as I put my knees together and act like a little boy. Um, so I'm actually looking for the idea of going back to the stage and you know, playing a part like T-Bag, which has led to other parts like T-Bag, uh, it'd be nice to get on the stage and show people the whole other side of me, the, the funny side or the historic side of me. I love, I love uh, characters in history. Uh, I'm doing a series in the fall that's from the 1960s, which doesn't seem that long ago, but there is a, there's a different way of thinking in the 1960s. Uh, there's an innocence about it. Uh, it's called Public Morals. It'll be on TNT in the States. Uh, and I 
uh, it's 1960s uh, Vice Squad Cops in New York City. It's kind of like a Serpico kind of feel to it. I play the, the captain of the force. Ed Burns wrote directly to start it, and it's, it's very good. Spielberg's uh, producing it, and uh, it's, it's going to get a lot of heat in the fall. So I'm, I love that kind of historical thing. I love things from the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. I've done a lot of Mob City was in the 40s. Uh, Carnival was in the 30s. You know, it's like when you can you, t you take a character out of history and you make it real and you make it potent for people now, and it's not a museum piece. Those those kind of characters fascinate me. Examples. Uh, <laughs> Shakespeare is always a tricky thing, right? Shakespeare is like, how can I? How can I? First of all, how can I understand it? Because it's really it's mind-boggling to me. And how can I make the audience understand it without going to be or not to be? Uh, that's, that's a little tricky. Uh, there are so many. Like if I was going to play a good role, if I was really crazy, I'd say, okay, I want to play Hamlet. If I want to play a bad guy, I'd say, I want to play Yaga. So I think both of those still are possibilities for me. Uh, there's a one-man play that I, I saw years ago uh, in Canada. At the, uh, at the Shakespeare Festival up there called Judgment. And it's a, it's a one-man play, a 90-minute play about a Russian soldier who wants to go back into active duty after having been imprisoned in a Polish monastery. The Germans and the Russians were playing, you know, ping-pong with Poland. And this actually happened in real life, that these uh, Russian soldiers were captured by the Germans. They were imprisoned in a Polish monastery, and uh, two of them lived and the only way they lived after, I think it was 90 days, is they had to resort to cannibalism. Uh, in real life, they were both shot. In the play, one's crazy, and one is on trial. It's a fascinating play, but it's not, you know, it's not a light comedy. So I have to be in that frame of mind, say, okay, this is, this is gonna be some hard work. But there's always, I mean, I'm gonna act until I die, so there's, there's so many possibilities of things that I want. Thank you. That's great news. Thank you Thank as well. You. Uh, my question is, did it ever happen to you? Thank you. Uh, did it ever happen to you to be mistaken with your character, especially t bag like, hey look, that's Robert Nepper. Oh, you mean that inbred pedophile? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> there are crazy fans out there. They're crazy fans. You know, I imagined the worst when I was playing T-Bag. I, I, I scared a few people uh, early on in Prison Break. Uh, when they would first see me, there'd be that momentary. <laughs> but then they would get over it and, and we'd move on. I, my favorite people on the planet Earth when I started acting were the British actors. And to me, British actors were people that, like Laurence Olivier, who uh, got in the shoes of the character and they were sometimes real people, and sometimes they were larger than life. But I always believed them. They were the character, no matter whether it was a good guy or a bad guy, whatever label you wanted to put on. I want to say now, too, the great thing about television and film, the television in the last 10, 15 years is the shades of gray that you can have in a character. No one is all black, and no one is all white. You could still root for T-Bag, for instance, even though you know he's a killer. And he, sh he should be fried. He should die. But there's so, there's so many fascinating colors to that guy that you that you somehow want, you want more. And that's that's something I'm always going to look for in characters. All those uh, there's more than fifty shades of gray, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, too. First of all, I wanted to say that I'm a big Prison Break fan, and uh, secondly, I wanted to ask, I know you're doing a new series called Texas Rising, and I wanted to know if you could tell us something about it. Texas Rising is uh, a mini-series. Actually, I think it's going to be in the States uh, for five different weeks, five nights, maybe four. I think it's ten hours, two hours a night. It's produced and uh, written by the same person and team that brought you uh, Hatfields and McCoys, was shot here in Romania about uh, four years ago, I think, with Kevin Costner and Bill Paxton. Texas Rising is about the formation of Texas 
back in the 1830s. It's a very patriotic, very controversial subject because it was a war with Mexico uh, to, to create this uh, confederation. This, this, not that it wasn't even a state yet of Texas. And Texans, if you know Texas at all, Texas is a very, very proud state. Yeah, I know. There's many years there where they just, they wanted to be their own country. I mean, they were like, <laughs> we're not even American, we're Texan. Uh, it's, uh, I just found out that we're, I'm going to represent the show at the uh, Monaco TV Festival uh, in June, which is a very good sign. It, it's internationally already being sold. Uh, TNT hopes it, uh, excuse me, History Channel, uh, hopes it's going to be as big a hit uh, and win as many Emmys as uh, Hatfields and McCoy. And if it does well, uh, they're already talking about the second incarnation of the show, which will start in October. So it's, it's a very exciting historical piece to talk about that. the other question there about how, to, you know, which characters I'd love to play. I mean, it's great to be in a Western. It's great to be on a horse. You know, we shot that in Durango, Mexico, and you feel like we shot on John Wayne's old farm, his ranch down there, and you just put on the hat, put on those boots, and we're like, great. Okay, thank you very much. You're so welcome. What's that? Uh, crazy fans? Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying, I can protect you, you just have to grab my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> you out the pocket. You pulling out the pocket. Uh, For those of you who don't know about the pocket, <laughs> now you all know about the pocket. <laughs> uh, but for real though, how hard was it for you to act for three seasons in uh, Prison Break and uh, one episode in Breakout Kings without the hat? Uh, <clears throat> you know, I didn't realize how much I missed that hand until, uh, well, I could say something really dirty. <laughs> no, I, I didn't realize how much I missed that hand until I did my next show, which was Heroes. And I went, oh, I can move my hand. <laughs> it was very easy to act with it because I had a very stiff uh, glove that I put over my hand and my wrist and my forearm. It was basically impossible for me to move my hand, so I didn't really have to think about it. And if you notice, especially in the fourth season, I was I would just start having fun with the hand, like I would stick a letter in it, or I would sometimes poke it with a pen, <laughs> or you know do funny things with it. So I had a ball with that hand. Thank you. You're welcome. How was it to yeah, how, was it, how was it to take it off the head, the hand off of the show? Was it like oh fine? Well. I just, you know, they saved a lot of, they could have saved a lot of money, but they didn't. They, they, uh, that, that second season was shot in Dallas, and the makeup artist knew an actual prosthetic company that made uh, hands and feet and legs for, uh, we were at war again. And uh, people were having their arms and legs shot off, and so she would make these uh, prosthetic things. And the same process that you do when you go into, special effects makeup store in, in LA, you stick your hand in a bucket uh, of goop and the, the substance hardens around you. You pull your hand out of the bucket and that's the mold for the glove, right? Well, she made the mold the exact same size as my hand because she was thinking, oh, he doesn't have a hand, we need to stick something on the, the stump of his arm and that would be it. The fact is, is that it was because it was the exact same size, uh, it hurt like hell. And especially in the second season, uh, when you see me like with the kids and having dinner and breakfast and making them, trying to pretend everything's okay, but this is Hollander, uh, I'm in a lot of pain. And I could only keep that hand on for about five, ten minutes at a time. And when they, here, give me your hand. When you, this is what it felt like. It's not comfortable. It's very, it's very uncomfortable. Oh my god. <laughs> now you can't see it, but his knuckle is white. And yeah. every one of my fingernails was white from that thing gripping my hand. And, and I would literally take it off. Sorry about that. It's all right. I, don't know it's I, would take, <laughs> I would take it off, turn the hand upside down, and the sweat would just go <laughs> onto the floor. And I went through three of those hands uh, until they finally got it right and made it bigger. <laughs>
he they wasted forty thousand dollars on that to get it just right. Oh hey, it was a good series. So it was a good good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Yeah. Oh hi. Um, I would like to know how was it to come back as T back in Breakout Kings? It was it was like putting on speaking of a glove. It was like putting on an old glove. Uh, I really didn't have to do much at all. Nick Centaur called me and said, you "Got this new show I created. I want to bring you back." I said, "Okay, I only want to do one because I didn't. You know, I just like I said goodbye to T-Bag, and that was it." And uh, I said, you, "You should pay me some good money." And lastly, uh, T-Bag never dies. And he said, "Don't, don't worry, T-Bag's not going to die." It was. Great. It was like an old homecoming. He said, I'm going to write you, I've got the best lines written for you, and the best storyline for you is T-Bag, and he was right. It was, it was great fun. It was good. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering, did you take inspiration from a certain character of the story, fiction, or whatever, for the role of T-Bag? Uh... No, I think what I did was more along the lines of how I grew up as a kid. Talking about my dad being a veterinarian, I modeled T-Bag after a lot of dogs that I saw growing up. <laughs> you got a lot of dogs here in Bucharest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, boy, they let us know that, that we were not welcome in that park. And uh, also, I, you know, I have a dog. We have a dog. And, and Dogs sniff each other's butts. I mean, they just go up and they just go, mm -hmm. and I thought T-Bag does that. He just goes, mm, I like that. I want that. <laughs> and they're because they're animals. Human beings were brought up saying, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Behave. Normal people that are healthy know how to behave. Animals, they have to, <clears throat> they have to, they have to mind sometimes. And T-Bag was so damaged that he, that that part of his brain was broken. He didn't know how to. Turn it off. Uh, I also, Ke Kevin Bacon in the movie JFK, I don't know if you ever saw it, but he has this. I remember right before I started it, I have, it's funny how certain things like hit you that are inspiration. And I just remember watching Kevin Bacon, he's in prison, he's kind of going like this. Uh -huh. He's walking, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to steal that walk. I'm going to totally steal that walk. Um, I heard, I don't know if it's true, Heath Ledger saw uh, T-Bag, somebody mentioned the, the Joker, and the Heath Ledger said, I like the thing he does with the tongue, I'm gonna steal that thing from the Joker. Um, so everybody, everybody steals from everybody else uh, in our business. You get inspirations from it. So I'd say more the animal thing, a little bit of Kevin Bacon, and then the rest of it was uh, whatever I wanted to think, which I'll never tell you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. I was asking about uh, Prison Break, so I thought, why not ask about Heroes? <laughs> and what was your experience with that, your character? I, I, I don't know if you noticed it, but I sort of created Samuel over about five episodes. I didn't, I didn't have him down perfectly in the first, uh, first episode. He was kind of Irish, and they said, mm -hmm. pull back a little bit from that. We're getting notes from the network. So then I was a little Scottish, and then I was a little Irish. <laughs> I was Northern England. Um, one thing I knew for sure is that it felt like doing Shakespeare. It felt like a, like a Greek uh, tragedy character. Um, that he, he wanted so badly to be uh, understood, he had no idea what was wrong with him. He didn't understand this power that he had to be, to be able to move Earth. And uh, it didn't help that his brother kept that from him. Um, they were very welcoming to me, that cast. They, they knew, hey, there's Prison Break, you know. And that was a, as, as viable a show, as, as an important show internationally as uh, Heroes was. So it was like, yeah, come, come over and our, play in our clubhouse. Come and play in our treehouse now for a while. So I had a blast. It was a lot of fun. And would you like to play in Heroes again? In Heroes of Boring? Uh, no. No, I kind of... It's the same way I feel about Prisberg. I'm not sure. I just, I just feel like I think that they're they're gonna do that again on Heroes, and I think they're going back to the first couple of seasons and those characters that, that they were surefire hits 
uh, back then. I think the show sort of lost its steam towards the end. Uh, when they brought Samuel on, I think they, they, it helped, you know, perk it up a little bit. But it was, people were like scratching their heads in the third season going, what? I'm not sure where this is going. But that happens sometimes. It happened with Lost. It happens with, with shows. So personally, the last season is my favorite. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, too. You're welcome. Oh, hello. I would like to know what is like the worst thing in acting to you, like generally. The, the, the worst thing in acting? Yeah, the disadvantages, the dark part of it. Uh, <clears throat> there aren't many anymore. I think the, I don't like waiting to act. I like being busy. Uh, and generally, uh, producers and first assistant directors schedule actors pretty well. There are a few times when you work on movies or TV shows where you wait around for five, six hours, and that's, that's horrible. That's just, uh, it just drains you. So that part of it I don't like. I also don't, maybe it's because of how I grew up in Ohio. I was brought up to work very hard, to always work and never give up. And, uh, you know, even with the success of Prison Break and Heroes and other shows since then, you know, you want you always want to be that person who goes, hey, you know, I'm here. Hire me. I'm the guy. And sometimes they go, you're not the guy. And that's frustrating. Because you say, but, but I was the guy. They say, but you're not the guy right now. We can go with another guy who, who's a little taller, a little shorter, a little smarter, a little dumber, whatever it is, uh, to have that. So that... <clears throat> That frustrates me sometimes because you think you can do anything, and you probably can do anything, but not maybe in their eyes. So, but then you get over it and you get a job and you go, yes, I'm back, I'm back where I want to be. Thank you. Hello, Russ. Uh, hello. So basically, you told us a couple of minutes ago that feedback is a monster. He's a predator. He was uh, ever going to be a monster, but. When I watched Prison Break, I actually noticed that he maybe really loved a lady. Do you think if that was his chance for salvation or it was simply a delusion or something like that? Really I think curious. both. I think he... I think in a way he probably... He totally believed that she... Let me put it this way. Anytime you're going out with somebody and they say, Thank you so much, you changed me. I'm doing this for you. Run in the other direction. <laughs> Because that person is not really changing. That person has to change inside. And if T-Bag was ever to get to the point of doing that, he would have to do a lot of forgiveness on his own part. He'd have to forgive his father for messing with him when he was a little boy. And uh, some people just aren't capable of doing that. He just always kept believing if, I, if, if she loves me enough, if we get married, everything's going to be okay. What I had to do as an actor is I had to believe that that was true. I could never judge. That's the thing about playing either a good guy or a bad guy. You can't, you can't judge these characters because then you're effed. You know what I mean? Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hey, first of all, uh, is it safe to bring tea back here since there are lots of children around? <laughs> He's here, isn't he? No, I mean about everybody being uh, over their heads about his role. About his what? His role. <laughs> being a, a pedophile, he's a pedophile psychopath. Yeah. He's a pedophile, psychopath, and killer. It, I mean, look, it, on television, mm -hmm. I'm, maybe there are one or two other roles in history that were as demonic as that guy who lasted four years, but there aren't, there aren't many, and again, that's... It's, uh, that's uh, kudos to the writers. And the fact that I liked, you know, honoring the words. And I never once said to them, I, this, is, this is awful, I can't play this. Um, if you notice, the Fox, they, they mentioned early on that he was a pedophile, but they didn't, they didn't really belabor that. They didn't stick with that too long. They went with the action of, oh my god, we gotta break out of prison. Oh my God, we gotta get, you know, find the money, and then, oops, I gotta stay alive. Those were more important things than dwelling on the, uh, on the negative. It would be interesting 
if you if you took that character out of the story and you just you know it's funny several years into the show I, I 